Hey, this is John Gordon with Positive University. And today my guest is John Acuff. John, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me again. John, you spell your name J-O-N, so I just know you're awesome. I mean, yeah, we don't need that H. Hannah needs two H's. Why, why am I going to hog them from Hannah? That's what I always <laughs> tell people. It's about generosity at the end of the day, I guess. I'm giving that, I'm releasing that H into the wild. <laughs> <laughs> See, as you know, John is the funny John. I'm not that funny, but he makes me laugh all the time. John, we're talking about your new book here and it is called Soundtracks. I'm holding it up for those who are watching, but if you're listening, it's this incredible cover. The book is called Sound Soundtracks. John, on the back, you have an amazing quote from Seth Godin. I'm just wondering why you didn't have John Gordon on the back cover. I, I believe you know why, because um, we're under the way my publisher works is it's a one John per cover limit. <laughs> and I already had John Acuff on there. I mean, even John, like John Maxwell didn't endorse it, but I would have been like, I'm sorry, Maxie. That's what I call him. Um, you know, like a lot of people call Michael W. Smith Smitty. It's just when you're close with people, you give them nicknames. It's probably it's like you and Matt. I don't know what you call Matthew McConaughey. I'm assuming like Maddie. Matty M. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I can, I can only have one John. So if my name was like Joe Acuff, you'd been right there on the cover, but unfortunately those are the rules. Well, Seth said a simple, powerful, and generous book, one that you will remember every day for the rest of your life. What an amazing endorsement. And the book is special. I loved it. John, what made you want to write a book called soundtracks? Well, the book's about overthinking. And I, you know, when I write a book or when I create anything, I look for three things. I look for a personal connection. Um, am I personally connected to it? Cause you know, better than all that you're going to talk about it for years and years and years and years and years. The second thing is I look for a need Do people actually need it. Um, the third thing I look for is a spot in the market. Like, is it already being overserved? Um, is it crowded? And so with overthinking, I've been an overthinker for years. Um, and I, I learned something about how to change that in 2008 that really changed the course of my life. So I felt a deep connection. The, the PhD who helps me with the books, Michael, uh, Mike Peasley, he and I asked 10,000 people if they struggle with overthinking and 99.5% of people said yes. So I knew there was a real need. And that was before 2020, like 2020 was catnip for overthinking. And then I went into the marketplace and there's a lot of great books about overthinking, but a lot of them say, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And my approach was, why would I ever turn off this amazing machine? What if I just fed it with the right things? Like I'm great at thinking, what if I just used thoughts that actually pushed me forward versus pulled me back? And so that became my angle. So once I had all three of those, I knew, okay, I'm going to create this book. I'm going to go on this journey. I'm going to invite a lot of other people to go on it with me. What is the problem of, problem of overthinking? Well, so I define it as um, overthinking is when what you want, uh, when what you think it's in the way of what you want. So let's just use an example. According to the New York Times, 81% of Americans want to write a book. Amazing, amazing goal, 81%. Every year, less than 1% do. And I would argue overthinking gets in the way a lot of that. You've, as an author, you've had the same conversation where somebody comes up and goes, oh, you wrote a book. I've always wanted to write a book. And they like... Writing a book, we all know how to do it. Like it's not magic, it's not a mystery. Going to the gym, we all know how to do it. You know how to find the gym, the door is unlocked. You, you, you own shoes. It's all the thoughts that get in the way of that. So my argument is overthinking um, is, is a sneaky form of fear and it steals time, creativity, and productivity. And so when you work on it, you get gobs of time, creativity, and productivity back in your life. And that's why it's such a fun, big kind of rambling topic to go, okay, I'm going to figure this one out and I'm going to figure out simple solutions and practical solutions. We're going to test them with thousands of people and then I'm going to create a book. Brilliant. Cause a lot of people have not figured out how to deal with overthinking. Everyone talks about it. Everyone knows it's a problem, but you have the solution in this book, which is, is amazing. When you found the solution, were you like, Oh, like I got to share well, this. It no, it hit me slowly because it felt too good. Like it was like a lot of things uh, I think some of our greatest ideas are so obvious. We don't think they're great. I mean, that's why we need community. Like I keep telling people like you need community so that so somebody can say like, no, that's a good thing. You need to share that. Um, so for me, um, in 2008, I got invited to go speak at an event. First time ever. I'd never done that. I even know people got paid for that like that. I had no concept, but I thought, I think I can do that. I didn't have any evidence. I didn't have any proof. I didn't have any repetition. I didn't have any practices. All I had was a thought, but the thought was enough. So I really learned that the things you think turn into the actions you do turn into the results you get. 
And so that became kind of a guiding principle. And 13 years later, it's my full-time career. It moved us to Nashville. It helped me hit the New York Times with sellers list. And that's where I said, I need to test these things with other people to make sure it's not just me. I think every author has a, it's just me moment. And then you go out and you start to really serve people and go, oh, here's how it applies to a single mom. Oh, here's how it applies you know, to a CEO. Here's how it applies. And that's when it's really fun to kind of catch the tail of an idea and get to share it. Does anxiety cause us to overthink or does overthinking cause anxiety? Uh, it's a great question. I guess my answer is I don't care. I just want to work on the solution. So for me, I think they, I think they can go back and forth because here's an example. There's this powerful study that Daniel Kahneman talks about in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. So New York University, NYU, they have two groups of college students and they bring them into a room and they go, we want you to make sentences out of these words. Here's a word bank, make some sentences. Other group, they say the same thing, but the second group, they hid words in there that were related to being old. So words like retired, bald, no offense to you, Florida. And they had all these words. So then they said, after you've done the sentences, the next part of the test is down the hall, walk down there and take it. And that's when they secretly timed how long they were walking. And the people who had been exposed to the old words physically walk slower, which is mind blowing. Just being exposed to old words made them act old. What's interesting to your question is a German research group reversed it. They made people walk slower than they normally walk and then look at a word bank and the people who had physically walked slower could see the old words faster. So doing the act changed their thoughts. So I think it goes both ways. I think overthinking can make you anxious. I think anxiety can make you overthink. Um, and then I like to jump in the middle of that and go, okay, so what do we do with that? Like, what do we focus on in the midst of all that? I work with a lot of sports teams. When I'm speaking to these athletes, I ask them, when are, we, when are you at your best? When you're thinking or not thinking? And they all say, when I'm not thinking, when I'm just in the moment, I'm in the zone. With thinking, you feel cluttered. You, it slows you down on the field. But when you're not thinking, you feel fast, you move quickly. Does that jive with what you're talking about in terms of, of this book, Soundtracks? A hundred percent, because that's the other part of overthinking is the goal of figuring out your overthinking isn't just to have a new thought. It's to have a new action. Like I'm always, everything I write, I'm always trying to lead you to action and results, like action and results. So if you, you know, I've got a note on my wall uh, that I'm sitting right in front of that says, ask for more, because I realized I was undercutting my value in certain negotiations. So I said, I need a new soundtrack ask for more. I wrote it down August 27th, 2020. Okay, great. It's great. It's nice to have a thought. A thought is nice, but unless I put that into action, unless I turn that into action, it doesn't do anything for me. So then I have to go, okay, for me to live this, what does it look like? Like in 2008, it's great that I have a thought. I think I could be a speaker. I think I could be an author, but until I turn that into the actions of traveling around the country, writing books, doing the research, doing podcasts, none of it matters. And so, yeah, I think, you know, when an athlete says that um, they're not thinking when they're in the zone, oftentimes it's because they've done the actions that it's become automatic. My, my principle, the three R's that I put in the book are you have to retire broken soundtracks. You have to replace them with new ones and you have to repeat them so often they become as automatic as the old ones. The reason you can remember the stupid thing you said three years ago in a meeting is because you've touched that story in your head 150 times. You've covered that story with handles. And so when you get a new thought, you're going to have to put a lot of new handles on it so that you remember it. The athlete that says that, that's not the first time they've executed. They've executed at that level every time, a thousand times through repetition. So if you're Dabo Sweeney, like... They're not seeing that play for the first time. That's the thousandth time and they run it like a machine. They don't have to stop and think about it. So that, I mean, that would be my approach to that. My second thing would be, I think every time you talk to athletes, you should be like, wouldn't it be cool to hear John Acuff speak? And then you can just give them my email, whatever it works easiest <laughs> for you. Definitely. Cause they need, they need this message. Talk about what a soundtrack is. What is a soundtrack? A soundtrack is my word for a repetitive thought. So some people will say a thought is like a leaf floating on a river, a car on a highway, a cloud in the sky. My thing is a soundtrack is a repetitive thought, something you hear over and over and over again. And you can like, you have a soundtrack for every person in your life. So we all have people that the minute we see a text notification, we don't even have to read the text. We go, Oh, here comes Mark about to ask me for a favor. You've got a soundtrack projects. You have soundtracks. And the shocking thing for me was even my most type a most accomplished friends, 
they, the people who would lay out their clothes the night before. So they go to the gym, don't choose their soundtracks before something. So I very rarely meet people that go, got a big meeting coming up. Here's the three thoughts I want playing on, on a loop in my head. Okay. Here's the things I'm preparing. We tend to think a thought is something you have, not something you hone as if you have no control over it. And once you realize, no, I get to choose them. I get to change them. I get to control them. Like that's when you'll be blown away at the freedom in that. That is so powerful. So you're saying basically we have to create our own soundtracks, our own thoughts that we can repeat and share when we're dealing with the negative thoughts that come in. Is that what you call broken soundtracks? Yeah. A broken soundtrack. Um, you know, so a broken soundtrack would be, um, you got taken advantage of in a business situation. So all business situations will take advantage of me. So now you're on the defensive and you go into every negotiation already in a bad spot. Cause you've got this soundtrack that says people are trying to take advantage of you. People are trying to take advantage of you. And unless you work on that, you're going to sabotage so many great potential business situations. So you have to say, Oh, wow. I didn't even know I was listening to that soundtrack. What am I going to replace it with? How am I going to deliberately repeat it until it becomes fresh? It's kind of like when somebody says, you know, I want to lose weight. Um, and I'll say, and they'll say, but it's not working. I'll say, well, how long have you tried? They'll say 10 days. And I'll say, well, how long did you, did it take to gain the weight? And they'll say 10 years. I'll say, so you you gave yourself 10 years to put it on. You're giving yourself 10 days to take it off. That's so unkind to yourself. Let's change that. Like, you know, and that might be a broken soundtrack of results should be fast. Or I like, there's a lot of performers that unless I'm an instant expert, it's the wrong thing. And you want to go, no, 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 no. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be amazing at that. You've never done it before. It's going to take some time. And so once you kind of get the nomenclature, the metaphor of soundtracks, you'll see them everywhere. And you'll start to say, I want some better ones. The book is called soundtracks. John, why do you want people to read this book and what do you want them to walk away with? Well, I want them to read it because the the most powerful story in the world is the story you keep telling yourself. And I think a lot of people aren't telling themselves a very kind story um, or a very helpful story. Um, and I think they don't know that they get to change the story. Um, and so I'd love to invite them into that conversation. And I think when they do, they're going to be really surprised. Um, and so that's, that's why I, I want everybody to, to check it out. I think um, it's really fun. Um, it's like everything else I do. It's really silly. It's, it's got a lot of humor, but it's also practical. So it's, I'm never going to give you a fuzzy solution. Um, you and I are in the same motivational space, but where we're similar, where we overlap is like, we want to turn it into action. We never, like you and I, like you and I don't say stuff like the universe will provide because it cares for you. Like I, dude, the universe is busy. Like it, it, the universe thinks very little of John Acuff. Like, so that, like, so I'll never have a photo of a cat hanging from a rope. And it says like, don't worry, the universe has you like, no, I'm going to be like, Whoa, Hey, here's three things we need to try. Here's like, you know, positivity matters. And here's how to turn that positivity into action. And so I, I think, especially on a podcast about positivity, even the conversation, like the chapter where I interviewed Tom Ziegler, Zig Ziegler's dad about positivity to me is worth the whole book. Yeah. I love that part in terms of, um, of, of positivity. And that, that was my favorite part. Cause I love Zig Ziglar. I met Zig Ziglar before he passed away. He's obviously in a very similar space on positive thinking, which I do a lot of and a lot of work on. And I love that aspect that you went to the positive thinking, but John, a lot of times people attack me for positive thinking. They say, Oh, that's Pollyanna. That's uh, fake positivity. What would you say to these people in terms of why it's important to speak positively to yourself and to the world? Well, I get it. First of all, I'd say I'm, I'm jaded and skeptical too. I didn't want to even explore positive thinking, but I kept running into people that were really successful, who I really admired, who, if you would ask them one-on-one -on -one, would admit they either gave themselves a pep talk. They had affirmations they used. They had some declarations, like the language is always different, but they are quietly doing this. And so I felt like I had to explore it. I had to test it. So we, we took, you know, a thousand people through this affirmations test to kind of figure out some of the research behind it. But then also what's so interesting to me is if like the argument is, okay, you should be positive. Well, I, here's a bad thing that happened. So we should throw out all positivity. Nobody ever does that with negativity. Nobody ever goes, well, one negative thing happened or one positive thing happened. So we're all negative. Like we just like to beat up positive thinking. Um, I think a lot of times we're afraid of it. We feel like if we can lean from a negative place, we won't get hurt. So sometimes people have been hurt before and they'll say, I'm never going to hope again. If I hope I'll get extra hurt. So I'll hold back, I'll have really small, tiny hopes and I, I won't lean into positive thinking. And for me, um, it makes such a big difference. It changes your, it changes your heart. It changes how you think. Um, 
But again, I think too, is my attitude was like, ugh, it's, it's fake. It's serenity now. Like, I think there's a lot of bad kind of wishy-washy positive thinking, but I like positive thought with positive action. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, I've seen that change my life and I've seen it change a lot of lives. Um, and here's the other thing, fear comes free. Faith takes work. Like mm. you don't have to look for negative thought. You have to work for positive thought. I think sometimes we don't want to do the work. That is so good. I always say it's not about ignoring reality. It's about maintaining optimism, belief, and faith in order to create a better reality. So we're confronting the challenge. We're looking at the difficulty, but we're staying positive through it. You have a great tip in your book that says, don't fight it flip it. And so when these negative thoughts are coming in, are you saying don't fight them, flip them? Yeah. So my thing there is, um, I'll give you an example. Somebody the other day was like, how do I get, how do I get over imposter syndrome? Like, how do I get over it? And I said, well, um, I think the first thing is you get rid of that word over like, cause over indicate over is a word of perfectionism as if there's one wall to climb and then you're done. I said, flip it to the word through, how do I get through imposter syndrome? Cause I said, I don't, you know, when somebody says you can be hundred percent fearless, I don't, I don't think I agree with that. I think every time you grow your life to different levels, there's new fears and new challenges. Um, so I'd rather say, how do you go through imposter syndrome? I've written seven books. I still have some days where I don't feel like a real writer. So, but I go through it. Like the fear, another thing I like to say is fear, fear gets a voice, not a vote. It's going to have a voice, but it doesn't get a vote. It doesn't get it to sit at the table and go, we're not doing that thing. So that's an example of a flip. We took the word over and flipped it to through. So what I like to do is say, okay, I want it to be simple. I don't, you know, I don't want it to be really complicated. Okay. If this is what you think, what's the opposite of that? So another example in the book, I talk about the worst boss I've ever had, just the worst boss. And it was me. I was a terrible boss to myself. And so I said, one day, okay, I can't do this anymore. What would the best boss do? Like in this moment, how would the best boss treat me? Okay, I've just come home from a trip. I worked like a madman for the last 36 hours, traveling all over the place. It's four o'clock and there's this voice that's like, you should go back in the office and do more work. What would the best boss say? The best boss would be like, way to go. You really killed it these last 36 hours. Take the rest of the day off. Like take your wife out on a walk. Like go have some, like, here's, here's 50 bucks. Go out to dinner. Like the best boss would do that. So I didn't have to spend this complicated, like, mapping process to go, I don't know what, what would the worst boss, I just flipped it said, okay, if I'm acting like the worst boss to myself, what would the best boss do? If you were your number one critic, what would your number one fan say? If your number one critic was saying you're the worst mom in the world, cause you were late to, to pick up line. What would your biggest fan say? And then spend a little time there. That's the flip. So good. John, you said you want to speak to more sports teams. Okay. Right now you're speaking to a sports team. You're going in talking to an NBA team. They are struggling right now. One of the players confides in you that they are thinking too much. They've had a couple of bad games. They're feeling fear right now. They're overthinking. What would you tell that NBA player right now? As you talk to them, coach them up. I would try to get a couple new soundtracks. I would try to get a couple new things that they believe. And I would also probably try to get them to remember a time when they are at their best. <clears throat> the problem with broken soundtracks is they always use forever words forever, never, always like we're always going to lose. We'll never have a, a, a committed team. All, everything will always feel this way. I'd go, no, 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 no. You've won before. You're not at that level unless you've won before. And sometimes we forget our victories and remember our failures. Failure is sticky. It's super sticky. And a lot of times high performing people are so fast to move beyond the win to get to the next thing that they barely celebrate. And so I'd go, okay, I want us to revisit a time where you won. I want to take some soundtracks out of that. I want to rebuild that. But that's where I try to go is, okay, what would it take for us to get three new soundtracks that you might not believe them yet? Like it's like what Zig Ziglar said, tell the truth in advance, tell it in advance and then do the work until it's true. And I love that approach. So that's what I would try to get. Because again, if you're an NBA team, you as an individual have one to get there. And I try to figure out, uh, I try to show you like, you already, you actually already have some soundtracks and, and here's how to expose them. And here's how to retire some of the broken ones. John A. Cuff is on a big stage. A few thousand people are getting ready to hear you. You've got these negative voices coming in saying, what happens if it doesn't go well today? What do you say to yourself? What are your soundtracks in your most challenging moments? I'll give you one. It'll either be a success or a story. I'm going to get a success or a story. Like it's going to be a success and things will well, or I'll get a story that'll serve other people. So I, I you know, I tell that story in the book. I had a, a meetup that just went terribly wrong. I brought a thousand stickers to hand out. I thought it was going to be great. Two people came. 
And one of them was a friend. So really one person came and I, I felt embarrassed, but even in that moment, I was like, I can share this and encourage other people. I had my friend take a photo of me sitting in a crowd of empty chairs. I posted it. I wrote a blog about it. It was my number one blog because it was me saying, yeah, here's this thing. Here's this thing that happened to me. So I kind of look at it and I go, it's a success or a story. The other thing is I'll tell myself some, some days you're the guy that carries the chicken at the wedding. Like, to be honest with you, I'm there to support them. I want the audience to win. I want the CEO to win. I want the event planner to win. Like I'm not the star. I'm not Bono. Like sometimes I'm one of the pieces of the thing and I might as well be the guy carrying in the plate of chicken at the wedding. Like nobody ever goes, man, that wedding was great. You see that one dude, the way he carried the chicken. Like I want them to love the speech. I want them to remember it, but I also like need to get over myself. So I try to, I try to remind my ego, like this isn't the John Acuff hour. This is the I want the Avtex software launch to go so well. And I want to play my role in that. And I'm going to play my role as hard as I can in that. But I also know that I'm trying to point the finger on the audience. Like the light is on the audience. The light, like I'm, I always tell event planners, if they work at the company, I'm there for an hour. You're there all year. How do I make you look like a rock star? Like if I look like a rock star, it doesn't help them. If they look like a rock, like I want that event planner to be getting texts from their CEO during the speech. It's like, way to hire this guy, way to hire this guy. So if I can have a servant attitude that way, it like when you're a superstar, you got a lot of pressure. When you're a servant, whole lot less pressure. It's a great mindset. I love that. When um, you're doing a comedy show, which you do comedy shows, yep. again, you're really funny, but sometimes a joke doesn't land. So you give a great joke. They don't laugh. What do you tell yourself in that moment to keep going when you don't get the laugh that you want? What's the soundtrack playing then? Well, I mean, the, the soundtrack I try to remember is like the 10th draft is always better than the first. So a lot of times where I would, where I'll get stuck is if I expect the first or second or third draft to be amazing. But, and the other thing is like different cities react different ways. If you do enough repetitions, you have enough experience to know that the joke that killed in Charlotte is going to bomb in Baltimore and you delivered it the same way you felt the same way. And so like, I, you know, the other thing is when you have a failure, you have two options as a speaker. You either sit on it and make it really funny or you move on and no one remembers. No, like you've had this happen where people come up to you after an event and they go, man, the thing you said was amazing. You go, which thing? And then they'll tell you something you didn't say. So you have to remember people are going to hear the thing they need to hear, not necessarily what you're going to say. And so that again, like I take the pressure off me. I take the pressure off me. It doesn't feel good. Like, but what's funny about virtual, I had a client, I've, been, I've done probably 40 virtual events. And a French Canadian client was like, Hey, say the word hustle in French. Um, during the virtual presentation, they said, if the joke falls flat, don't worry about it. And I was like, if the joke falls flat, I won't know. <laughs> like, I can't see anybody. I just am assuming for 45 minutes, I'm killing it. Like people are dying, laughing and taking notes. And so now, like, now that's probably going to be my attitude that I bring in to a live event is like, I know, I know my material. I know like how to take the, the audience different places. And if they don't go, they don't go with me, then like, that's okay. Like, we'll like, I'll get them on the next one. I've done a lot of virtuals and the, and the other day I did a, a physical event in Texas. I felt like I was a better speaker after doing all these virtuals. Do you think virtuals have made you a better speaker actually? A hundred percent because you have to bring a hundred percent of the energy. Like in a live event, you can be like, Oh, the room feels a certain way. They're adding 15%, 20%, whatever. On a virtual it's you and a camera and maybe one tech dude and the tech dudes already heard your stuff. So like, <laughs> You know, like you just really have to commit to that lens and really commit to bringing the energy at like 150%. So, yeah, I think, you know, for me, the challenge was um, because of how it was spaced, the last live event, like live events, the spacing is going to be different. Comfort levels are going to be different. So you as a speaker have to be really flexible. I asked the crowd, hey, can you pull out your iPad and actually turn on Zoom so I can feel comfortable right now? Oh, that's well? good, dude. That's good. Yeah, that's good. I love that. That's such a good line. I had something funny for once, John. So fantastic. Fantastic. That's a great line. That is such a, mine, my opener has been like, I don't feel like the murder hornets were as bad as they promised us. Like, <laughs> that's what I, I say. So I'll say, I wanted to start my speech with a positive message. I think we can all agree. It's been a pretty positive experience. No one got stung by a murder hornet. And so that's kind of my, like my ease in. The one positive in terms of um, the book, you talk about Anthem, which I love like having an Anthem. Can you explain what an anthem is? 
Yeah. So my goal is if somebody reads the book, if they take the course, if they listen to my podcast, I've got a podcast called all it takes is a goal. I want them to feel like they're building a new anthem for their life. Not one new soundtrack, not two, but a collection of them. So they're going, okay, that was helpful. I'm going to add that. That was encouraging. I'm going to add that. I think we all have anthems. Just most of the time we've never really deliberately built them. Same with a company, every company, like all culture is that a company is a collection of soundtracks that are all playing at the same time. And very rarely does a company pause and go, wait a second, that's a broken soundtrack. Like I worked at a company once where the the broken soundtrack that was kind of unwritten was you don't get to question the head legal counsel because he went to college with the founder. That doesn't mean he's the best legal counsel. It doesn't mean that he knows everything for 40 years in a row. Just that became the unwritten. You don't do that. And because we as a company wouldn't address that, it, it created less than awesome production. And so that's a broken soundtrack. So my hope is whether you're a company, whether you're an individual, you'll actively go, okay, this is part of our, this is part of our anthem. Family has, families have anthem. My daughter um, is in high school band. And in high school band, you can challenge the chair higher than you. It's arranged in chairs, first chair to like 10th chair. And she got excited about challenging people above her. And it's awesome, super competitive, super encouraging for the kids. And she challenges one kid and he was like, oh, what? What are you, one of those tryhards? And she was like, yeah, that's right. I'm a tryhard. Let's go. And he forfeited. He wouldn't even play against her. And so she just kept marching up the ranks. And so one of our family anthems becomes, became like, yeah, we're tryhards. Like that's a hundred, like that you meant that as an insult, it's a badge. We'll wear it. Like we try hard. And so that's, what's fun. Every family has them. I, your family has them. Companies have them. Teams have them. The best teams you go speak to. If you said to them, what are the three things you guys always say? They wouldn't go, Oh, we like to win. Like they would go, like they would know them because the coach had repeated them over and over and the team had repeated them and they own them and they personalize them. That's what I mean by an anthem. What about a fight song? Should we all have our own fight song for our life or our theme song that drives us forward? A hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, I, sometimes I'll have what I call get up music where it's the first song I listen to when I'm coming into the office. Like I want, you know, this is my get up music. This is kind of a, I like to think about slingshot songs. Like it's not just marathons that you need music for it's, it's life. Um, and so, yeah, I love adding, you know, and, and here's the thing. Like a soundtrack can be a statement. It can be a song lyric. It can be a question. One of the soundtrack questions I give teams all the time is, um, who are you doing this very difficult job for? Who are you doing this difficult job for? Because I believe resilience is tied to purpose. And the bigger your purpose, the bigger your resilience. So I'll ask teams that. I asked a room full of hospital CEOs that question. And um, a woman raised her hand, which is a difficult job being the CEO of a hospital because they don't get to say it's not life or death. It's not brain surgery because it is both of those things. And she said, I do it for the donor walk. Like that's what I do it for. And the donor walk is when somebody donates an organ, they line the halls, all the doctors, all the nurses, all the administrators, and they cheer as their person is wheeled to surgery to donate an organ. And she said, I do my difficult job for, for the donor walk. So one, that's a soundtrack question. Who are you doing this very difficult job for? Two, part of her soundtrack is I do what I do for the donor walk. Like you need to have a collection of those so that on the days when it's not easy, like that's the myth. Positive positivity takes work. Like you don't just wake up every day and go, oh, I walk the beach. Now I'm super happy. Like it takes work, but the benefits far outweigh the work, but it's just a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to have a piece of paper that has my five anthems, or I'm going to, you know, when I hear something, um, I'm going to write that down. I, like, and I, I collect them. Like now I'm a nerd about it. So like Patsy Claremont, um, really successful author, probably written 40 books. She told me um, when she wrote her first book, it came back with red ink all over it. Just crushed her red ink everywhere. She said it looked like it was dying. And she said, I asked the editor to use a different color. She said the next time the editor used green. And this time when I saw the edits, instead of feeling like it was dying, it felt like it was growing. Dude, are you kidding me? Red ink versus green ink. One is dying. One is growing. So now like imagine next time you get feedback, you don't go. That person attacked me. You go, I'm growing. Like I'm growing, like that's game changing, dude. So I'm going to write that down as a soundtrack. So it's not just that you sit down and come up with them. You listen for them. You turn on your heart, you turn on your head, you turn on your ears and your life is so much better when those are the things going through your head versus you're the worst mom. You'll never get that done. Who are you to write a book? You know, you can't start your own company, like all those. When I look back at my life, I often say I wasn't failing. I was becoming and I was growing in those moments. And I think about your daughter, what you just said. I love the fact that she was competing and willing to challenge. Whereas that person said, are you a try hard? That person was actually scared of the competition because that person's probably tied 
you know, to their, ide- their identities tied to their performance. And if they lost, they'd be considered a failure. Your daughter wasn't worried about failure. She was saying, Hey, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to compete. I'm not tying my performance or my outcome to who I am. She felt confident enough, obviously to go after it. I love that. She was thinking of it that way. How can we encourage more people to think like that? Well, I mean, I think you show the example. Um, I think sometimes we need to believe in somebody else before they believe in themselves. Um, and, you know, I think just showing that it's possible like that, you know, when I, when I tell somebody I have imposter syndrome, I know because I've written books that encourages them because they think by book two, I've gotten rid of that. And if I'll be honest and vulnerable in that moment, it encourages them to go, Oh, wait a second. Okay. Like John, it's, it's okay that I have that feeling. It's okay. Um, with kids specifically, I always tell parents, you know, give your kids tons of grace. Cause sometimes what happens is I'll have a 45 year old dad go, Hey, I'm trying to get my 15 year old into these goal setting books. I'm reading. He won't read them. And I'll go, what took you an extra 30 years to get there? You're 45. You gave yourself three extra decades <laughs> and you're, you're mad that the 15 year old doesn't want to read the same things you're reading. Like, come on, dude. Like their frontal lobe isn't even fully developed. So I think as parents, that's the tension. That's the dance. Like we've all been there with our kids where when they show a passion, you're trying to water it and nurture it and give it space, not suffocate them. Cause it's real tempting as a parent, when a kid lightly shows interest, like I kind of like art. You're like, you're an artist forever. You're an artist. Every present you get for your birthday or Christmas, you're now an artist. It's all art stuff. And they're like, Whoa, Whoa. I just, I like sketching like this afternoon. And so I think that's the dance as parents is, I mean, the big thing is being engaged, like being engaged with what they're doing, who they are, um, and what form of motivation actually moves them forward. Cause the same kid, like you can have two kids in the same household and they're just complete opposite. Um, and that's John last, parenting. John, last time you were on the podcast, it was before COVID it's now after COVID or towards the tail end of it. We're still in it right now a little bit in terms of, what you learned during this time or how you grew during this time. So many people had suffering and pain and we all have, but at the same point, there's been a lot of blessings along the way. What's a positive during this time for you? What's something that came out of it that you didn't expect that actually was, was a good thing. Well, positive then, you mean travel. So I was able to be home with my family. Um, I was at, you know, my oldest daughter is a junior in high school. So the time's pretty limited. So I, I definitely see that as a positive. Um, I was able to start a podcast. I, I had wanted to forever and was just intimidated by it. And I was able to go, okay, no, I'm starting a podcast. Like I'm doing a podcast. Um, and so that was, uh, that was definitely, definitely a positive. Um, and yeah, for, I, I tell people that, um, a crisis is an invitation to innovation. It encourages you to learn things you might not have learned on your own. And so I think we can all go, yeah, I wouldn't be good at doing these online. I wouldn't I'd be terrible at WebEx. Like, and, you know, it fast forwarded some things. And so I definitely look at those um, as, as positives. And I got more comfortable in front of a camera doing 40, 40 virtual events. Um, so, yeah. And then, you know, I think those things and just, you know, relate, it, it put a priority on relationships. And then the big soundtrack for me was I spent like eight weeks just like grumpy. You know, like people, if you're a public speaker, that people understand you lost your job essentially. Like it'd be like if I were if I was an accountant for a big firm and I packed up my boxes, you could tell, oh, you lost your job. If you're a public speaker, like you do a bunch of virtual, but you, for a season you lost your job. And I was just kind of grumpy about it. And then eventually I came to a place where I was like, I can pine or plan. I can pine for the old way or I can plan for the way I live right now. And so like, I got to a place where like the pining wasn't helping anything. I was being a grumpy jerk to anyone who was in my hemisphere and it was delaying me from rebuilding the stuff I needed to rebuild. And I think there's a lot of people that are in that space still. And so I just encourage them like, it's fine. Like throw the world's shortest pity party, have a pity party. Don't give me like express your feelings. I'm not saying that at all, but just make sure it's a short one. Like don't do a six month pity party, like, or a nine month, like, you know, cause the longer you spend in blame, the less time you have to build. John, when does the book come out? April 6th, April 6th. And what are you excited about besides this book as you move forward in this journey called life? Um, I'm excited about like some hires I'm trying to make for the team. Um, I'm excited. I've been kind of afraid to have a company and now I'm kind of admitting like, Whoa, I love a company and I need a company. Um, the second thing I'm excited, I love the podcast. The podcast has been super fun. I was intimidated by it, but it's been fun to see the growth of that. Um, it's been fun to see listeners react to that. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, and then I, we did this big online challenge where we got almost 10,000 people 
to take this overcoming overthinking challenge. And so I was excited about the stories that came out of that and the community. I, you know, one of my soundtracks has been crisis magnifies kindness because the little things you do right now are worth 200 times what they were a year ago because we're all so isolated. So like I'm been, I've had a lot of fun doing that. And then from a, a hobby perspective, I think I talked about this last time I was on right before COVID. Um, I love doing Lego sets. So I'm excited that like, I have a dorky hobby that is entertaining to me. Like, I feel like a little kid in a toy store, like, and I actually have a budget. Like I have a pretty dope allowance. Um, so I can go in and be like, I'm going to get a huge Lego set. Like that's, <laughs> that's the nerdy side of me. I've loved that. Is that your hobby? Do you have uh, another hobby that you started skiing, during COVID running skiing, running? And, um, I'd say Lego. I, I think like once your craft, like once your hobby becomes your profession, it's no longer a hobby. So I would say there was a time where writing was my hobby and it's not anymore. Like it's my profession. So I have to actively work at, okay, how do I have other hobbies? Um, but yeah, right now skiing, which is super easy in Nashville. I mean, we're 500 feet above sea level. Like it's not the best hobby for this area. Um, but running, I love to run. Um, and then I would say Lego sets, um, is the door. If they go down in dorkiness, like skiing's pretty cool. Not that running's dorky, but, um, this book is, um, coming out, as you said, April 6th, incredible book soundtracks with, um, with that in mind, don't say it, but do you already have another book that, you know, you want to write already, or is that something that will come to you, you believe as you're open to it? Yeah, I'm testing ideas right now. So again, I'm, I've got a bunch of different ideas and I'm going, I'm testing them with uh, like people, like a, a live audience to go, is this helpful? Is this a need? I'm kind of in that phase right now, but I think, I mean, I've written a book called start and I've written a book called finish. And I think I need to like finally bite the bullet and do the middle. Like, okay. <laughs> well, I talked about two lines, the starting line, the finish line. Like I need to, and it's a harder book to write some in some way because it's like the joke I always do for people is that um, like if you ask somebody to divide a goal in three segments, beginning, middle, finish with like a 30 day goal, they go beginning will be day one through 10, middle 11 through 20, finish 21 through 30. But the reality is the beginning is day one, the middle is days two through 29 and the finish is day 30. So there's a whole lot of middle. And so that's what I think I'm going to explore next um, is how do you you know, how do you kind of make it, not even just make it through the middle. I want it to be more positive than that, but how do you, cause that's where people quit. Uh, I thought you were joking when you said it, but I actually love the idea of focusing on the middle because that is where everything happens. It's in that middle. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I won't call it middle. Cause I just don't think that title works. Like nobody <laughs> wants a book called middle. It's just not motivational. Like, and if you title a book wrong, you're doomed. Um, so I, I don't know what I'll call it, but I'm going to explore some degree of that. I don't know what will come out of that, but I'm going to put a, the, the more I do this, the more I realize if I can create a bunch of ideas and then test them with people, it allows the book, um, to be seen by more than just me. Like if I write a book and I'm the only story in it, that's very narrow, like soundtracks, there's 35 other people's stories. So like you can see yourself in it versus just, it's another version of John's memoir. Like I'm 45, like how many memoir type books can I like get? Like at some point you have to be like, okay, this is like your 10th book where you're the main character. Like it's a little, it's a little much already. Like you're 45, pump the brakes. <laughs> John, where can people find out more about you and the book launch and, and all that good stuff? Soundtracksbook.com. Um, you can read the first chapter. I always tell people like, check out the first chapter. Um, soundtracksbook.com. My website's acuff.me, A-C-U-F-F.me. Um, and then my podcast is called All It Takes Is A Goal. So if today was fun and you're like, oh, that was, I like that. I want to hear more of that. Um, I do a podcast about goals because I'm a goal nerd. And I think a goal is the fastest path between where you are today and where you want to be tomorrow. Um, and you also share a lot on, on YouTube. Where can people find you on YouTube? Yeah, I'm just uh, author John Acuff. Um, I'm on, yeah, YouTube was another thing I invested in um, as far as like this last year. And then Instagram, John Acuff, Twitter, John Acuff. So kind of all over the place. But yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody who wants to check out my work. Um, it's always a blast to have a conversation with you. It's always great talking to you. And it's spelled J-O-N, everyone, the right way to spell John. Exactly, exactly. And, and soundtracks, check it out. It is an amazing book as someone who you know, was really focused on positive thinking, positivity, helping people overcoming negativity, adversity. This really gives you a blueprint, a lot of wisdom, a lot of research, a lot of understanding, and a lot of practical ideas on how you can actually turn off 
that negative thinking and turn on the right soundtracks for your mind. It's really powerful. It's awesome. Thank you, John. Thanks, John.